Uh, so we're excited to have Dr. Ilya Finkelstein presenting to us today. Uh, he's an associate professor in molecular biosciences here at UT. He is also the 2021 recipient of the Norman Heckerman Award in Chemical Research, which is very cool. Um, he holds both a bachelor's degree at, from UC Berkeley and a PhD in Stan, or from Stanford in Chemistry. And he is a post. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University Medical Center before coming here to UT in 2012. Um, his research focuses primarily on developing innovative ways to investigate how genomes are maintained and the machines or mechanisms used to edit and repair genomes. In addition, he's interested in molecular level inner workings of gene editing tools such as CRISPR to ensure safe and effective gene editing. Um, and currently uh, in COVID, in relation to COVID, um, his lab's more recent work involves the development of a reagent that was important for COVID vaccine development and a collaboration with other labs at UT to engineer a spike protein uh, named Hexapro that induces increased production of spike proteins in lab grown cells. Um, so please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Ilya Finkelstein. Thanks, Brianna. Can you all hear me? I couldn't have written it better myself. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. Let's try this screening and sharing again. Did that work? Yes. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, let's see, how did I get here? As you've heard, this is not my main bread and butter. Hold on a second, I'm trying to get my screens ready. Okay, this is not my bread and butter, but here we are. Um, around February, when it was clear that the pandemic was, or at least I was reading from the news that the pandemic was coming, we decided to do something about it. Um, and that's when I started looking around where we can maybe make an impact. There were two real areas where I thought an impact could be made. One was in diagnostics, when people were scrambling to um, scale up diagnostic capacity and come up with innovative diagnostics. Frankly, I thought that wasn't a long-term play for several reasons. I think diagnostics are a solved problem. It's just a scale-up thing, and academics aren't good at scale-up, right? We're good at doing something innovative that only works every other Wednesday, and then industry comes in and sort of makes it work robustly and scales it up. Um, so I didn't want to go into diagnostics that left uh, vaccines as the only other interesting thing to do, in my opinion, for a rapid pandemic response. That's when we partnered with Jason in March. We've been talking about collaborating before that. We have joint students now. But in March, I surveyed my research lab and I said, hey guys, um, who wants to work on COVID stuff? We are in a pandemic. And pretty much every single person in the lab said, I want to work on COVID stuff. We didn't because of lab shutdowns and stuff. We actually never shut down, but um, only a subset of my lab was able to continue this work. So as you just heard, we worked on uh, second generation spike antigens for SARS-CoV-2. That work is published, um, not particularly. Uh, did Jason talk about this? The second generation spike stuff, in which case I can skip it. Uh, he, he's spoken to us a couple of times, but sometimes we have different folks in the group. So I think you can give a quick, a quick overview for the newcomers, especially. Okay, this is a one slide summary, so it's great. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, the original Spike, uh, double. so Spike itself, I thought I had a movie on this. You know what, I have the wrong presentation up, I think. Hold on, hold on. Technical difficulties. Did I not put this presentation right? I've just confused myself. Give me one second. Oh yeah, wrong one. Give me one second. Here we go. Maybe. There we go. All right. So here's a scary Halloween themed movie for you. This is why Spike is so important. Can you see this movie now? All right, so here's a spike glycoprotein attached to the viral membrane. You're seeing the S1 domain in pinkish red, the S2 domain in yellow. The glycans are these white things. They protect against the antibodies. Um, the S2 domain binds, the RBD of the S2 domain binds ACE2, the surface receptor, gets cleaved at the furin cleavage site. Then you have this harpooning mechanism, massive transformation of the protein structure. Um, this is the S2 subunit that is fusinogenic. 
um, undergoes this alpha helical zippering, the zippering of these two subunits, which pulls the membranes of the host and virus together, and then the virus is in. So that was our Halloween movie. All right. So that's why spike is important. It's uh, the protein that gains entry into cells. And also the protein that's the target of most of our neutralizing antibodies in our immune system, right? So um, brief summary, here's um, a prefusion structure in left. And these are these ribbon diagrams. I know I'm not speaking to an audience of molecular biologists, but you can see there's a massive rearrangements from a mushroom-like shape to this linear harpoon-like shape. That's the post-fusion state. And the name of the game in vaccine design is to uh, stabilize the prefusion state and present that as an antigen to our immune cells, hoping that it will get a polyclonal antibody response that will protect us um, so that the virus doesn't enter the post-fusion state, at which point it's too late. So Jason's work um, fortuitously had worked on MERS before, or Jason's lab, and they had prefusion stabilized MERS with the um, two prolines that will make Jason very rich, right? And so um, those two prolines are now, of course, in first generation spike designs. They do a pretty good job of keeping the protein in the prefusion state. The protein is still fairly unstable and about 30% of them actually enter the post-fusion state. So the double proline wasn't, um, was a first generation design and it was the design that companies went with very, very rapidly on uh, early on in the pandemic because it was very straightforward to generalize from MERS to SARS and SARS-CoV-2 because you can see the alignments are very, very clear. Here, if you look at the al sequence alignments, these are the amino acids that make up the S2 subunit. You can see that they're very conserved and the double prolines um, are marked, the place where the double prolines are inserted are marked in red here. All right, so that was gen one. Um, we worked on second generation spike with him. Um, just briefly, we did it. It expresses at least tenfold or closer to 30 fold better. It's much, much more stable. The only um, goal of the picture shown here is that if you look at the double proline spike, it degrades uh, very rapidly at higher temperatures. But if you look at, which is a proxy for protein stability, if you look at the picture of the six proline spike that we ended up designing, um, you can see that the uh, protein remains quite monodispersed and, and makes nice little particles, mushroom particles in this electron micrograph all the way to high temperatures. So um, this was a work that we, uh, our labs really worked very closely together on this, also with Jennifer Maynard's lab. We worked 24 seven, about 40 of our students to, in total um, spent a lot of time um, um, trying to put this together. And really we tried a bunch of different kinds of um, protein stabilization tricks. The prolines tended to work best for this particular protein, uh, but ultimately we ended up screening hundreds of variants and their combinatorial, um, uh, hundreds of individual point mutants and hundreds of their combinations. So it was a lot of work, very, very low throughput, okay? And so now it's the basis of a vaccine that's ending phase one trials globally, um, including in Mexico, Brazil, Thailand, and a few other places. It's used extensively for serological applications. And we are in talks with major RNA therapeutics, uh, RNA vaccine manufacturers, at least one, to try to adapt um, away from um, spike 2P. So Jason is in the interesting position of working through against his own patents. But that's a different story. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But it is a much better antigen, frankly. And we, we and others have shown that it actually elicits the same kind of polyclonal immune response as a uh, spike 2P. Okay. All right, so what did I learn from this lesson? So that was challenge one, rapid antigen stabilization. So um, it was very low throughput, labor intensive, quote unquote, rational engineering. We had the structure from their prior heroic work in February. Um, but um, I thought as a, uh, as a molecular biologist who likes to do high throughput things that we really need to develop rapid design build test cycles. And the one thing that in increasingly strikes me as a newcomer to the vaccine field is how backwards it is. And I, I think, I mean, I, I, I love vaccines. I think they're amazing. I think there's no profit motive in vaccines, right? It's very hard to give people something that, that give healthy people something that may protect them prophylactically in the future. And especially if you only do it once or twice in their life cycle, it's not a very good business model. So I don't think there was major pharma investment in vaccines for many years. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to upgrade the tools of vaccines for rapid, uh, rapid response uh, to pandemics and so on. I think, I think it was kind of shocking to me compared to some of the other fields I work with that are very rapidly moving. How, how far back some of the vaccine tools are compared to the rest of molecular biology. 
All right, so that was challenge one. I'll tell you what we are trying to do now to address challenge one. Um, chapter two, very briefly, we've been doing a lot of viral surveillance. This is my lab because I do a lot of next gen sequencing uh, kind of work. Uh, we were contacted by Jim Musser's lab at Houston Methodist. I don't know if you guys have ever worked with him. Interesting guy. He's a clinician in infectious diseases. He runs the infectious diseases unit for Houston Methodist, which is the largest hospital chain in, in that area. And their goal was to sequence every single patient that comes in with COVID. Um, we've sequenced, this is outdated. We've sequenced 20 plus thousand SARS-CoV-2 genomes at UT Austin from Houston. At some point we were the biggest sequencing effort in the all of Texas, which is shameful because it was all private money. And um, the state would come to us and say, hey, can you sequence these putative B117s? And, you know, because they had an S dropout and we'd be like, okay, fine. But the state literally had no sequencing effort available. Uh, this was fine. We worked on it. Um, I, I don't think scientifically it was particularly interesting because again, it was just counting pebbles on a beach. You know, most of these genomes were important for surveillance, but not so interesting from a molecular biology puzzle kind of question. However, you know, we we learned a few things. We saw D614G sweep through the country or through Texas. Then we saw you know, the other variants sweep through Texas, beta, delta, whatever they're called now, uh, it mirrored what the rest of the country was seeing. You know, Houston is a large metropolitan area with multiple introductions, probably from international travel, very large international community, nothing particularly surprising, I would say, from my perspective. But um, we do see a bunch of weird clones, right? We see a bunch of variants of SARS-CoV-2, which all go into GISAID, the database that tracks these um, molecular variants. And we don't know the clinical or molecular significance of almost everything we see, right? That's the sec second major challenge, right? We don't know what most of these variants are. The only ones that get attention are the ones that really start sweeping the population like Delta is doing now, right? By the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So just taking a deep dive into GISAID or GIS, I don't know how to say it right, GISAID. Um, you know, this is a little outdated again, but here's a cute little plot showing all the different variants. Some of these have received, this is again outdated, uh, B1617 hasn't yet taken over when we made this picture, when we downloaded the data to make this picture. Um, of course, if you look at the sequencing density globally, um, the U.S. was lagging behind, but the U.S. is slowly catching up now. With the Elio, I have a question about that, that image, which is cool. Is it is there anything? Which one? The, the, the one on the left? Yeah, the cool Is it just yeah. that the, the area is proportional to the frequency in the just say database? Correct. Correct. Is there anything, or is there anything else more we're supposed to take from the picture? Is it just area is proportional to? Area is proportional to counts in GISAID. It does not mm -hmm. normalize. I didn't, we didn't, when I made this plot, we didn't normalize it by, um, you know, region or anything. This is global. Okay, great. And the only point is, and I, we cut it off at 500 um, variants. Of course, this thing goes to forever, right? There are single counts of weird, maybe sequencing errors, maybe um, just very rare variants. So um, the point of this plot is to illustrate that there's lots of variants. Not all of them get the variant of concern or interest or whatever designation. Some of these variants are kind of lurking in the background and could have really interesting information about what total viral fitness is. That's what I'm interested in. Where's the future, right? And sorry, just for, yeah, for those of us who aren't in the, that familiar with this. Are these, um, do you call things a different variant if they differ by one mutation or are they, is this based on some sort of clustering analysis? How do you, how do you- Oh, yes, 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 sequences yes. To, to a variant? So I am using the, we are not variant calling ourselves. There are people who do these um, cladogram analyses and so on. We don't. Um, we use the, uh, the pan link, pan, There's one group that does this for a living. We use their analysis. I just forgot their name. They have a little lingo to it. Um, in short, um, it's complicated. Different people do different things. Like for example, Delta is 15 different things nowadays, right? Um, so these are major lineages. So I think we cut them off at, you know, like the third decimal point. It's a dual decimal system. There are some minor variants on those as well. Yeah, so this is not a representation of every single possible point mutant. This is a representation of some clustering down to maybe three subclusters. 
but I can't remember all the details now. Fair enough. And the whole point here to illustrate this, I mean, I'm not just showing this as a pretty plot. I'm trying to illustrate that the goal, my goal, one of my goals is to understand what the molecular future of the virus looks like rather than being uh, responsive to incoming variants of concern. We want to be prospective and look forward. Has the virus reached maximum fitness, right? Is there going to be increased transmission? If, if once we get into this endemic state and we start going against the immune system of vaccinated non-naive individuals, how much fitness does the virus have to uh, evade polyclonal response? That sort of thing, right? Understanding viral fitness is really, really important. Is this thing going to go like the flu or you have antigenic drift? Or is this thing gonna go like a more stable virus because it has an RNA dependent RNA polymerase that can repair its own mistakes and therefore it's not as uh, mut mut mutation prone as the flu, which can also undergo recombination, right? So these are the kinds of questions that we're trying to address here. All right, also just a reminder that of course our sequencing data is very sparsely sampled in Africa, especially. Um, so some countries have no sequencing data at all. And of course, we have no idea what's happening over there, especially with low vaccination rates. All right, cool. Um, any more questions on this? I just have a quick question. Yes, Tango, thank you. <laughs> just uh, kind of spitballing here, but does the, does the rate of new variants correlate with the, like if this were a time series, would the rate of new variants correlate with the, just the explosion of, of the winter surge and like if you lined up new cases, plus or minus testing and new variants, would you see those graphs kind of line up? Yeah, I think that's a tricky question because sequencing density is also, or sequencing rate is also increasing and it's very mm -hmm. heterogeneous. So big population centers sequence more. So I think it would more or less correlate with sequencing quantity. Okay, so, but in a perfect world, <laughs> if we sequenced everybody's infection, like, I guess what I'm wondering is the, is the rate of variance a function of the rate of cases in the theoretical world? If that's would, even possible to answer. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would have to imagine that has to be the case. Yeah. So the virus has roughly 30,000 nucleotides in its RNA genome. Um, the number of copies of virus you have in a single patient is sufficient to sample every single point mutation that the virus can possibly make. Right. Wow. So just a, yeah. So just the numbers are the virus is sampling sampling its viral fitness every time it infects a single human. So in fact, probably even within a single human, there are multiple lineages fighting it out, if you will. Wow. Okay. But that we can't see that in the in the seroprevalence data because we're just not doing enough sampling. We're probably not doing enough sampling. There's only two or three countries that are even close to sequencing all of their um, patients. Denmark is one of them. Um, the UK is doing an admirable job. The US is still less than 5% of all cases, which is embarrassing because it's not sequencing capacity that we're lacking. It's just political will to do it. Um, yeah, Thanks. so my guess, so yeah. And so, you know, the other interesting thing about these variants of interest and variants of concern is that they, the current theory is that they're emerging from immunocompromised individuals with a long sustained infection. I don't know if you've heard this one, but, um, there's lots of cases now of people who are immunocompromised because they're on cancer, immunotherapy, cancer therapeutics or whatever, or they're um, for other reasons, maybe they're organ transplant recipients. And those people can sustain a COVID infection for many months. So um, there, when you sequence, so there's now a few studies where they've sequenced those people over time, and that can actually see the virus mutating to be more immune evasive over time. Um, in those patients. And of course, if that passes on from that patient, then um, you can start something new, some new variant. So I'm actually interested in, in mining gis aid for, um, sometimes there's enough metadata to know this, to find patients who have sustained a long infection, and they're going to be very rare out here, but these are the ones that are really showing evolution in action, let's say, in response to a weakened immune system. So those are more interesting than the like big, you know, rectangles to me which is why metadata is so useful and working with clinicians is so useful to me, right? Cool. Um, all right, shall we move on? Oh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, 
Yeah. Yes. Sweeping. Just a yes. comment, not a question. Yes, delta variants, delta or whatever, beta, whatever, they sweep through and they, they wipe out those things. But again, I'm looking for prospective, not what's happening today. I'm looking for what the virus can potentially do in the future. Right, so. A quick question too, sorry. Um, I was wondering, you talked about viral fitness and I was just wondering if there are sort of standard measures of viral fitness or if it's a um, more loose notion. I mean, the best measures outside of human populations, right? So the best measure is epidemiological. You're fit because you've swept the globe, I, I would say. That's the real world um, thing, unless there's some sort of weird founder effect. Um, you can rule that out. Um, people do competition experiments. Those are the gold standards, typically in a golden hamster or some other good model for, an for a respiratory virus. And they'll take virus A and virus B at similar titers, meaning the similar number of viral particles, and they'll squeeze them into the nose of the animal uh, and see which one wins inside the animal. Those are, as you can imagine, very time-consuming and expensive experiments. You cannot do that for 5,000 variants. And then you get to less and less, I would say, more and more in vitro, less and less real world scenarios where you can do competition assays in cell culture, where you can see, you know, Delta is supposed to be more fusinogenic than prior variants. And that could explain why it's um, more transmissive, but that's, you know, that's getting farther away from real world. All right, so if I may, I'll just, um, I really appreciate the conversation, but if I may, we're gonna get through this. So I've outlined, just a brief summary, I've outlined challenge one, how do we develop antigens quickly and maybe not have to rely on structures if structures are not available or being very lucky with a colleague who's studied MERS for their whole life uh, nearby, right? Um, how can we think about viral fitness, right? So the question here is, let's see. Um, uh, for example, the circulating variants, evade therapeutic antibodies, that's an important question. So, and another final important question from a molecular biology perspective is to map so-called epitopes uh, and mutational landscapes. We've talked about mutational landscapes a little bit, how much space does the virus have to play? Of course, this is a highly multidimensional space and we're never gonna scratch the surface of, of trying it, but we can at least get some interesting ideas. Um, and also where do polyclonal antibodies bind? And this is important for two reasons. First, you need to know where therapeutic antibodies go and how evasive those areas of the virus are. So again, here's a picture of spike. Uh, and in blue here, we've plotted the mutation frequency of spike from GIS-A. So this is real world data. And you can see that there's regions of the protein that are highly variable and regions of the protein that are highly invariant, right? And the reason that's useful is, or the D614G is sort of in red here because that's 100% prevalent now. Uh, the reason this is useful to know is because uh, you can imagine designing antigens that would focus the immune system to produce a polyclonal response against invariant parts of the virus, right? That would be useful. Also, you can design therapeutics that are targeting invariant parts of the virus. Eli Lilly has a monoclonal antibody therapeutic that they took all the way to the clinic and then the virus changed and that therapeutic no longer works. That's a huge loss of time and effort, um, right? So far the Regeneron cocktail continues to work. The Eli Lilly was a single monoclonal and it was almost inevitable that would happen. Um, all right, so again, showing the mutation frequency, you can see there's parts of, so I'm now gonna zoom in on spike because I love spike uh, and that's all I study. I do not study viruses, I study spike. Um, okay, so you can see that there's areas of spike which are highly enriched in mutations in gis and some that are not. So the N-terminal domain um, has a very large disproportionate, disproportionately large percentage of all mutations. There's very clear hotspot mutations. They pop up in all the variants of concern and so on and so on. So here's the big picture take home and then I'll tell you briefly what we're up to these days. Okay, so the big picture take home is I wanna create a mutational map and scan it for fitness, and I'll define fitness in different ways, um, of the spike protein. So this is a high throughput approach. Basically, you can imagine taking every single position in this 1,200 amino acid protein. I'm just showing the first 25 here. Building a, uh, a mutation 
are building a set of these spikes. So with every single amino acid substituted at every position, just one at a time, of course, if you do it combinatorially, even two becomes impossible. And essentially um, scan, for example, for function. And what are these functions? What, what can these functions be? For example, how stable is the protein if you have a mutation of position five to an alanine, just as an example. Um, how well does it bind antibodies? And we can take different interesting antibodies. How well um, does it bind ACE2, the receptor? And so on and so on, right? So these are the kinds of questions we wanna ask at large scale. This is called deputational scanning. This is a field called deputational scanning. And people have done some deputational scanning of the RBD, most notably Jesse Bloom's lab has made a living on this, um, which is of course a critical domain, but the NTD is quite important, the N-terminal domain. The RBD binds ACE2, the NTD has an unknown function, but is targeted by most of our polyclonal antibodies, has tons of neutralizing antibody epitopes in it, and is very rapidly uh, clearly evading our immune system in all of the circulating variants. Lots of hot spots of mutation in the NTD. Uh, the function of the entity is not clear still, but some people think it somehow positions the, um, somehow pushes the RBD up. So it may be talking to the RBD structurally. All right, so here's our approach. How much time do I have? Am I out of time? I can start editing on the fly. No, you're good. We have till 1030. I'll edit on the fly as needed. Okay, um, okay so here's our approach. Um, we're going to do mammalian cell surface display. So now we're getting into molecular biology. If I slide into too much jargon, please stop me. Sometimes I'm, I try not to, but I will inevitably slide into jargon. Uh, and I'll explain why this is, this is useful, but here's the basic setup. We develop a mammalian cell system where the spike protein is expressed or variants of the spike protein are expressed and tethered to the surface of that cell. That allows us to connect this variant of spike, whatever it may be, to this cell. So it's a one-to-one -one linkage, which is important because now we can do this in a library format where we can look at thousands of these. This setup has a few interesting features. There's a physical linker. There's a transmembrane domain, that's this X, that tethers into the, into the membrane. Then there's this physical amino acid linker. It has a few interesting features. It has a uh, antibody epitope, this is a flag antibody. This is a proxy for expression. So basically if you light up this region um, using a fluorescent antibody, you know how much stuff you have on the surface. Then you can um, uh, pure, you can cut it off using the yellow um, feature here, which is a cut site, it's a protease cut site that allows us to actually shave the cells and recover these proteins for downstream biochemical and biophysical studies like structural studies. And this blue thing here allows us to actually enrich them on a specific enrichment column. So we can shave them off, enrich for these proteins, and then study them biochemically, or we can study them on the cell surface. Then we can add fluorescent antibodies, for example, neutralizing antibodies that bind to NTD, inhibitors that are, let's say, ACE2 decoys uh, or competitive inhibitors, or fluorescent ACE2 itself. Okay. And so here's the workflow. We have a robotics-based assembly platform where we can just build these out using um, robotic fluidics. Uh, then we can screen them using fluorescence-assisted cell sorting. So we're looking at fluorescence of, say, expression by this green antibody and neutralization by this red antibody. And then we can cut them off and do structural biology and biophysics, binding assays, et cetera, for the interesting variants. That's the high throughput stuff. Uh, let's see. Does it work? So this is about to be published in MoleCell. This is our first proof of principle. I'll try to get to the latest, latest uh, soon. Um, does this work? Yes, it does. I'm just showing you here images of, of um, fluorescently stained cells, just to indicate that the um, cell nuclei are in dark blue. The cell membrane is outside. You can see that the spike protein is stained with, um, particular stain is in red on the surface of the protein and it's co-stained with this anti-flag antibody, which indicates expression. So yes, it's really there, the controls make sense. We can, as I said, shave it off. This is actually Hexapro. We can shave it off, put it on our electron microscopes and build out these little structures. You can even see the RBD subunit of one of the RBDs in this home homotrimer pointing up, a little finger here. So yeah, so this, this protein is well folded. It's on the cell membrane. Um, 
And we can do some controls. Uh, we can look at binding by ACE2. We can look at the 6B stands for hexapro. So here's 6B D614G. It binds ACE2 very well. If you just express the RBD alone on the cell surface, that binds ACE2 very well. If you remove the RBD, you don't have ACE2 binding. Um, SARS-CoV-1 binds ACE2, of course. If you look at the MERS spike or HKU1 spike, um, they don't bind ACE2 because that's not their cell surface receptor. And this is a key point. Um, actually, let me jump to this key point right now. Um, this platform should allow us to do the rapid antigen design very, very efficiently for any emerging pathogen. So for example, as a proof of principle, we uh, took a bunch of different um, beta coronavirus spikes. And again, this is not very far from SARS-CoV-2. So this is a safe proof of principle. But we can display on the surface, cell surface, right? This is a general platform for displaying viral glycoproteins on cell surfaces and engineering them. So we can take the viral glycoprotein from um, different beta coronaviruses, put in some stabilizing mutations, and check how that correlates with what the gold standards is in the field, which is to laboriously clone the protein, express the protein mammalian cells, wait six days, purify it, and do biophysics on it, which is what we did for Hexapro, which is what took forever, took months of hard work around the clock. And you can see that the relative expression we get on cell surfaces, this is now one student spending 24 hours on this, correlates very, very nicely to what the gold standard is, which is purification and you know, all our rigmarole. The point being is that now, instead of designing antigens via this, how shall I call it? the traditional boutique, you know, artisanal, let's like stare at the structure and make some educated guesses, rational design approach. What I wanna do is just slam this into our pipeline, um, have the robot assemble 5,000 different variants and test them all at once in a pooled format, pick some winners and then put those into the artisanal pipeline. This is gonna prevent us from needing structures and prevent us from relying on people who can just sort of sit there and kind of go, mm, put a proline here, let's try it. Um, of course, we'll always need people like that, but um, this could be complementary. So just as a proof of principle, we've perfusion stabilized other beta coronaviruses um, and um, shown that, you know, playing this proline game works for SARS-CoV-1 and works for SARS-CoV-2. You can see the expression level going up for SARS-CoV-1 but it actually is detrimental for MERS. So if you wanna play games with MERS, actually double proline MERS is pretty much the best you can do, right? And this is just testing these prolines. Of course, we can now test thousands of variants and their combinations. HKU1 didn't really matter. So that version, that's, that's um, goal one of this particular platform that we're developing, high throughput screening for antigen stabilization. And of course, our goal is to expand into spillover viruses, okay? So, you know, we now have a little bit of funding to do this. Uh, people try to rank what spillover viruses may look like. So these are viruses that have zoonotic transmission potential and include viruses that have been um, shown to transmit from one animal to another or even from one animal to human or human to human transmission after an animal to human event. So these are called um, spillover viruses with some zoonot um, some um, pandemic potential. People have now made lists of these. Coronaviruses always stop the list, but there's other scary kind of viruses with viral glycoproteins where we'd like to basically build out, here's my vision statement one, basically try to build out first generation pre-fusion stabilized antigens for any of these, for maybe the top 20 spillover potential viruses. So we have the pandemic preparedness ready to go. With RNA vaccines, you can just slam them into your deltoid pretty quickly. You just need to know what the antigen is. Without good reagents, you don't know what you're gonna, what needs to be synthesized for RNA therapeutics. But if you have the good antigen, even a mediocre antigen, <laughs> if you can get it quickly enough, you can make a huge difference. So that's vision statement one. Any questions on that? No, they're all on board. I'm hiring. <laughs> uh, vision statement two, to understand um, where antibodies bind. And the goal to, of understanding where antibodies bind is um, twofold, right? We wanna understand how the viral fitness, how the virus can escape 
antibodies once we get into the endemic state. Uh, and then will help us understand when it's time to update vaccine formulations, which isn't cheap, right? And the real challenge there is there's still no clean correlates of protection for SARS-CoV-2. So right now, the reason we're not updating all of these vaccines, to my understanding, with say Delta specific vaccines is, well, frankly, they're probably not necessary. And second, um, um, without a correlates of protection, you're probably gonna have to run another clinical trial, which is just gonna be very expensive. Right, we are not in a situation where you can update these formulations like one can for the flu, or annual flu vaccine. And secondly, if you know where the viral epi where the where the best epitopes are in the viral glycoprotein, you can then start designing antigens that that show those epitopes, and then you can really focus the immune system on the parts of the virus that matter. Right now, much of our viral um, our um, antibody response is hitting the NTD, and the NTD mutates like crazy. So you really don't want to have antibodies to the NTD too many antibodies to the NTD because the, the virus is gonna escape those pretty quickly, if that makes sense. And so people typically do something called alanine scanning and that's what we did. So this is a busy graph, I'm sorry. We focused on the NTD because again, it's the, it's the focus, um, it's the target of most of our um, and polyclonal antibody response in most patients. This was a paper that we published with uh, Greg Polito and uh, George Giorgio's lab recently where they looked at patients, or no, sorry, vaccinated. Was that convalescent? I can't remember now. It's all mixing up in my head. Anyways, the bottom line is NTD antibodies are important. So in the early days, one of the best NTD antibodies, neutralizing NTD antibodies, this is a phenomenal antibody, um, 4A8. It was published by a Chinese group. It was never commercialized. I believe it was um, routinely used by the Chinese military though, both as a um, prophylactic and as a therapeutic in the early days of the pandemic. Um, so this, this thing binds to a little pocket in the NTD, um, really blocks infection. Unfortunately, it is no longer useful because pretty much every single circulating variant these days has escaped from this epitope, right? So what we do is we just took a region of the NTD and just mutated each amino acid one at a time into an alanine. This heat map shows how well this antibody for A8, which we purified, how well it binds to this protein. White means no change from wild type. Red means much worse than wild type. Sort of minus seven is our limit of detection. This is a log scale. So basically a single point mutation of position 145 to an alanine uh, completely kills this antibody's binding to that, to that site. Um, and if you look at the structure, which they nicely solved in their paper, you can see how that makes sense. So, the re so here we, we color our results in red onto the structure and you can see that it's quite correlated, right? Every place that's red in our heat map is where the antibody gets into the NTD, right? Makes sense? And you can see these, you can get into molecular detail. You can actually see these pi pi stacking interactions. Here's position 145. You can see there's a pi pi stack interaction with this position 109 in the NTD. If you make that into an alanine, that interaction is of course abolished and therefore there's no more binding. And that's a critical interaction, essentially sense binding to zero. So, um, you know, this is why the NTD of many variants of concern have a, either a deletion of this position. This is, turns out to be a very important epitope. Lots of antibodies go here. In fact, you can see that when we expand our study to many more antibodies, you can see that there are certain regions that keep lighting up, right? If you just read across horizontally here, um, highlighted in here. So this is the call to N1 loop in red, N2 loop, N3 loop, N4 and N5. You can see the N1, N3 and N5 loops are the targets of most of the antibodies that our bodies make. And the end one, you can see that there's a lot of red different antibodies here. Different kinds of antibodies bind different loops. You can't have one antibody binding all loops. They're physically far away from each other. But the bottom line is these loops are under extreme selection right now in the GIFSA database. So this is the kind of information that this platform can reveal. It's very useful. You can, this is combinations of mutations as you'd expect more than combining two or more mutations really abolishes binding, which is nice control. Uh, we can go into clinical patients. So this is not alanine scan. This is actually clinical circulating mutations against the same antibodies. And you can see that we can pick out um, circulating variants that abolish binding to these antibodies. Not surprising. So sorry, these are, are these circulating variants that you know uh, don't the antibodies don't uh, don't bond bind to, 
Or no, are these no. all these are the, circulating variants and you're just looking at the distribution no. of mutations? No, no, no. There's a, there's a, a ton of circulating variants in the NTD. Mm -hmm. um, we picked out, so we did this alanine scan to mm -hmm. define the positions where the antibodies bind. So in mm -hmm. many cases, the antibody, so why do we do the, all of this alanine scanning? First of all, structures don't tell you everything. Mm -hmm. and for most of these antibodies, right. there are no structures. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. so um, this particular antibody has a structure and it was a good place to start. But um, even in this antibody structure, the authors point out, oh, there's five interactions between this antibody and that, and that pocket and NTD, they have no idea which ones are important. Mm -hmm. In fact, the ones that they say seem important are actually dispensable according to our functional map. So this is a structural mm -hmm. map, we have a functional map. Mm -hmm. And the one that they didn't highlight is the one that completely abolishes binding. Mm -hmm. So you actually don't know which of these structural, so they just see this yeah. thing looks like this, but is, it, is losing this pocket imp important mm -hmm. or losing this pocket? Maybe this one is the most important, right? Don't know. Does the structure uh, provide any useful information? Like, is there any reason to take that step or should you just go right to sort of the approach that, that you take? The epitope mapping, they're complementary. Uh -huh. So to be clear, um, we use their structure to define which amino acids to scan. I see. Um, but so you just considered them. more than what they, than the few candidates they pointed to. You were a little yeah. more inclusive, okay. We more were more inclusive because we were scanning yeah. across like a dozen antibodies or something. Yeah, interesting. Um, and in many cases, these structures weren't available, but um, we saw a pattern, right? Um, also, knowing how the structure happens here, so, you know, people are trying to define supersites on Spike. So there's pretty good idea now, at least on the RBD, that there are four or five, depending on whose paper you read, supersites, where pretty much all the antibodies go. And the goal, for example, if you're a Regeneron, is to pick two antibodies that go to two different supersites, right? If you go to the same supersite, there's a chance that a few point mutations and you're going to kill the cocktail, right? Yeah. So this is why antibody mapping is really, or epitope mapping is really important, structurally mm -hmm. and functionally. Both are important. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess my question for the second, for the next slide was, then what was the subset of naturally circulating variants you were looking at in that? Oh, right. right. So the subset was informed by our alanine scan. So we uh -huh. knew which ones were important in the uh -huh. alanine scan. Uh -huh. And we found corresponding positions uh -huh. in the GISA database. Uh -huh. But remember, alanines are not natural, right? This, uh -huh. There's no alanine substitution, position 145 in GISA. But there are three other substitutions in that position, uh -huh. right? There's a histidine, right? Uh -huh. um, and so on and so on. So uh -huh. we don't know what those do. Just because an alanine breaks that interaction doesn't mean that a histidine would. Mm -hmm. So you have okay. to actually check all amino acids that are physically at that position. Got which it. is why you need these large throughput approaches. Right. Where you can scan okay. all amino acids of position X, Y, Z, et cetera. Okay, thanks. So yeah, so now you can do this kind of thing again, and you can even look for deletions, right? So we didn't look for deletions in our in our alanine scan, but deletions are very, very common in the in the NTD of spike. All variants of concern nowadays have some deletions in the NTD of spike. And look, position 144, 145 is right there. That's loop N3 that kills for binding to all of the antibodies here. All of this red stuff, that's loop L3. So 145, 144 keep showing up and um, Spike has just decided to delete them basically. <laughs> and that completely abolishes that epitope. Uh, does that make sense? And so if you look at the Regeneron cocktail, you know, it's, it's nice to see that a Regeneron cocktail maintains. So we, we have both antibodies from them and um, it maintains activity against all these variants. I should mention that the variants we found that break the antibodies, they're relatively low frequency, right? So on the x-axis is the abundance. Um, so on the y-axis is the um, binding in our assay. And on the x-axis is the abundance um, in the GISA database. You can see that there's a few mutations that are relatively high abundance, but um, across all lineages, across all fangal lineages, but um, they don't break the binding too much. And the ones that are really bad for escaping polyclonal uh, antibodies are relatively low frequency right now. This makes total sense because the virus isn't optimizing for, for immune escape. There's enough naive hosts right now. The spread, spreading fast is the winning strategy for the virus. But very soon, we're gonna be in a situation where at least in some highly vaccinated pockets or convalescent pockets um, where antibody escape becomes the primary evolutionary driver for spike. 
we're going to approach that soon, I hope, <laughs> which, which is to say endemic. <laughs>